Welcome to lecture number 57. This is topic 6.3, Westward Expansion, focusing on social and cultural developments that happened in the late 19th century. The theme is migration and settlement. The learning objective is to explain the causes and effects of the settlement of the West from 1877 to 1898. The first key concept deals with the reasons for moving out West. In hopes of achieving ideals of self-sufficiency and independence, Migrants moved to both rural and boomtown areas of the West for opportunities such as building the railroads, mining, farming, and ranching. This movement out West embodies Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. The West had always proved to be a place for anyone to find new opportunities regardless of their background. This is a continuity of the belief of manifest destiny from previous periods. The idea that the U.S. would expand across the continent to the Pacific and settle across the vast territory. The new inventions that made westward settlement possible, like railroads, the telegraph, dry farming techniques, and new mining techniques, are aligned with the idea that the frontier forces settlers to adapt and drive innovation. As for the concrete opportunities that the frontier provided, one main opportunity was steady work in railroad construction. Irish and Chinese immigrants were the largest groups in the labor that constructed the new rail networks. Their contributions were central to completing the Transcontinental Railroad, which is commemorated on the picture on the slide. There were also cheap opportunities for moving west to begin farming through the Homestead Act. However, most homesteaders did not manage to meet the required five years that would give them clear title of the land. A lack of rainfall and competition for water rights with other industries made it a lot harder for homesteaders to succeed. A lot of them ended up just going back to the east or buying better pieces of land from speculators or railroad companies that they had acquired as a result of their subsidies. Mining could be done individually or for a larger company. Individuals could practice placer mining in which they pan for gold flakes that run through streams. Larger commercial mining companies would then get involved when the only mineral deposits left were deeper in the ground or required more complex methods to extract from the ore. Finally, cattle driving provided opportunities for those out west, though the pay was little and conditions on the drive were harsh. With the advent of barbed wire, cattle driving evolved into just ranching. Cow towns like Fort Worth, Texas established rail lines that transported cattle to distribution centers and provided opportunities for internal migrants to work in the cattle industry. The next key concept covers some negative effects of expansion. As migrant populations increased in number and the American bison population was decimated, competition for land and resources in the West among white settlers, American Indians, and Mexican Americans led to an increase in violent conflict. The Plains Indians relied on the buffalo for their livelihood. After they had adopted the use of the horse from Europeans in the 17th century, they became very adept at hunting buffalo. They used all parts of the buffalo, so it was a vital resource. The meat of the buffalo was used as sustenance or food, the skin as clothing or shelter, the bones as tools. Their livelihood depended on this animal, and as new settlements by whites grow, they began to hunt buffalo for leisure. With the knowledge that fewer buffalo would lead to weakened American Indian resistance, white settlers moving into the land increased their killing of the American bison. The picture on the slide shows buffalo skulls piled up, with people standing at the base and at the top of the pile for context. It is clear that they were being killed at a rate that would put them in near extinction. On the map on the bottom right, the lighter areas show the previous realm of where buffalo used to roam, and the slightly darker brown is the late 19th century. Then finally, the dark brown areas that are almost not visible are the present-day bison herds. Deforestation was taking place in the Pacific Northwest, where there's a lot of trees and they could be used for construction or even exported as a raw material. As a result of the decimation of natural resources, the conservation movement starts to take hold. The first action that was the protection of Yellowstone by making it the first national park in 1872. Also in the 1870s, environmental advocates like John Muir start their careers and call for preservation measures after visiting places like the California Sierras and Yosemite. John Muir was a preservationist. It's a little different than a conservationist because John Muir wanted everything to be kept as it was without any human use. He co-founded the Sierra Club in 1992, which continues to lobby for environmental protection measures in the present day. The violent conflict that heightens tensions between the U.S. and Plains tribes happens in 1864, when the U.S. Army killed hundreds of Arapaho and Cheyenne non-combatants in Colorado. The massacre was actually followed by a congressional investigation in which soldiers and witnesses testified. The investigating committee found that Colonel John Chivington, who ordered the attack, did so deliberately despite having knowledge of the friendly character of the victims. The committee recommended that he be removed from his position for bringing shame upon the U.S. Army, Though by that time, Shivington had already resigned his commission and escaped any legal ramifications. The next major engagement was the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, sometimes referred to as Custer's Last Stand. It was part of the larger Great Sioux War of 1876, or the Black Hills War. 
in which the federal government was trying to seize control of the Black Hills where gold had recently been discovered. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, leading the 7th Cavalry Regiment, was in pursuit of Indian warriors and began an attack on an Indian village that had more warriors than they had expected. It resulted in a defeat for the U.S. troops and losing about a third of their force, including Custer himself. The last major event in this period string of violent conflicts with Native Americans was the Wounded Knee Massacre in December 1890. In the lead-up to the massacre, a pan-Indian cultural movement called the Ghost Dance was spreading through the country. The U.S. saw it as a threat and pursued Native leaders to promote the practice. Spotted Elk was one such Lakota chief, whose band was stopped on their way to the Pine Ridge Reservation by the U.S. 7th Cavalry Regiment. The Army's efforts at disarming the band resulted in a stray bullet, which triggered the American troops to fire upon all of the camp. Wounded Knee is traditionally used as a turning point in American Indian history. With the decline of the ghost dance, the assimilation movement, and the widespread use of reservations, American Indians' future seems most bleak at this point in their history. There were also violent conflicts with Mexican Americans. Despite the rights that were guaranteed to Mexicans by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the 1840s, they continued to experience discrimination in the Southwest and displacement by white settlers. They are the subject of extrajudicial punishments and lynchings in the Southwest when they try to resist displacement and discrimination, or when they pose an economic threat to white settlers. It's difficult to identify Mexican Americans who had been lynched because when lynching statistics were compiled, they were categorized as white. However, there is a strong likelihood that Mexican Americans comprise a majority of those white victims of lynchings. Historians estimate that between 1848 and 1928, there were at least 597 lynchings of Mexicans in the Southwest. The next key concept covers in more detail the U.S. violation of treaties. The U.S. government violated treaties with American Indians and responded to resistance with military force, eventually confining American Indians to reservations and denying tribal sovereignty. The main treaty that we look at in this period is the Treaty of Fort Laramie, ratified in 1868. It was negotiated to settle a war that the U.S. lost against the Sioux. It closed off the nearby Bozeman Trail to white settlers crossing through the Sioux Territory, and in return, the Sioux would agree to the establishment of a reservation in South Dakota with ownership of the Black Hills. In the 1870s, Congress unilaterally changed the terms of the treaty to take the Black Hills after gold had been discovered. The campaigns of George Custer and the 1876 Sioux War worked to dispossess the Sioux of the Black Hills despite the agreement of 1868. Thus, the U.S. confines Indians to smaller and smaller reservations after they continued to take lands that had supposedly been set aside for natives. In 1871, the Indian Appropriation Act ends recognition of Indian tribes as independent nations. This is what the concept means by denial of tribal sovereignty. This means that there won't be any more treaties between the U.S. government and Indian nations because the government doesn't recognize them as sovereign nations anymore. Now, the government is just going to legislate what they want to do with Native Americans, though it also fails to grant them citizenship. It has detrimental effects through the end of the century and won't be corrected until the 20th century. The attempts at resistance ultimately fail. Leaders of these resistance efforts like Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce, all of them are either killed, arrested, or sent to reservations. The Ghost Dance Movement was a pan-Indian movement adopted across the country by various Indian tribes. It was based on a vision by a Paiute spiritual leader that the ghosts of Indians killed by white settlers would come back and aid in the fight against American westward expansion. It took on variations with each tribe that adopted it, but in some instances it also promised the return of the bison herds. This is seen as a threat by the United States and the U.S. Army, so their attempt to restrict the practice resulted in the Wounded Knee Massacre. There were white advocates for Native Americans in this time period. Helen Hunt Jackson's book, A Century of Dishonor, details all the times in which Native Americans had been unjustly killed or had treaties violated by the U.S. government. Though her concern and criticism of the U.S. government were genuine, Jackson's solution to the conflict was for American Indians to assimilate into U.S. society and shed traditional cultural practices. In 1887, Congress carries out the greatest land dispossession of American Indians in history. The U.S. government was no longer making treaties with American Indians, they were just legislating new policy as they saw fit. Congress, similarly to what Jackson advocated, wanted for American Indians to assimilate to white American culture and to start using the land that they had for agriculture. They thought that if they gave all American Indians their own plot of land that they would be forced to take up agriculture. The Dawes Severalty Act of 1887 partitions 47 million acres of Indian land and gives set amounts to each Indian household. 90 million acres remain after the partition. The land that remains was usually the better quality plots, and those are sold to speculators, settlers, and railroad companies. The profits from the land sales would then go to fund reservations or Indian schools like Carlisle Industrial School, 
which will get covered in the last key concept. The advertisement on the screen is advertising Indian land that had been left over after the Dawes Severalty Act. It's finally reversed in 1934 under the Indian New Deal of FDR's administration, but at that point a lot of the damage had already been done. The last key concept says, Many American Indians preserved their cultures and tribal identities despite government policies promoting assimilation, and they attempted to develop self-sustaining economic practices. One of the most damaging assimilation tactics that the U.S. government used was the use of Indian schools to try and assimilate younger Native Americans. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School was the first and most prominent one. It was created by Captain Richard Henry Pratt. He had been an officer in the U.S. Army and had been responsible for American Indian prisoners of war. He realized that given the right instruction, they could take up white ways and become assimilated to the United States. His worldview and motivations for starting a school for assimilation was summarized in a speech in which he said the goal was to kill the Indian in him and save the man. Indian schools often led to the loss of culture and depth for some students because of lack of provisions and permanent separation from their parents. Some would never return to their tribe given that travel was really expensive and distances were long. Pratt used pictures of the students at Carlisle to promote the successes that the school had in assimilating students. The picture in the top left shows a Navajo man who with long hair and traditional garb on the left, and on the right is the same student after his transformation at Carlisle with a short haircut wearing a collared shirt and jacket. The picture on the bottom shows the Carlisle Indian School football team. Sports were another way in which the Carlisle Indian School tried to assimilate students. One of the most famous football coaches of the early 20th century, Pop Warner, was the coach of the Carlisle Indian School. He made Carlisle into a formidable football team, aided by one of the most talented athletes in the early 20th century, Jim Thorpe. Thorpe later became an Olympian gold medalist, a professional baseball player, and a professional football player. About 200,000 American Indians were left in the United States at the end of the 19th century, and most of them lived in poverty or were living in reservations. But through the 20th century and into the 21st century, the population rebounds to about 3 million in the present day. There will still be more hardship for them in the 20th and 21st century, but it is a sign of resilience from American Indians in the United States that all of these attempts at assimilating them and erasing their culture did not work. Alright, finally for the recap. Americans expanded out west for economic opportunities. The expansion had negative environmental effects on the bison, who were decimated. Violent conflicts arose primarily with Native Americans. Federal government policy threatened the survival of many tribes and their culture, referring primarily to land dispossession and assimilation. And finally, the resilience on the part of Native Americans was critical to the recovery through the 20th century. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.